Carl and Michael, thank you for giving engaging and dynamic presentations. Because what I'm about to talk about for the next 15 minutes would be really, really awkward otherwise. And I might have to show you <laughs> my vacation slides or something instead of this. Um, so really quick, can I see a quick show of hands? How many of you here have attended the JALT annual conference? OK, yeah, I go every year. I'm a proud member. And I've never walked away without attending at least one fantastic, memorable presentation. Um, one more question. Of those of you who have attended JALT, how many of you have ever said to yourself, I would really like those 25 minutes of my life back? <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, um, me too. And so from my experience, it's not because the ideas of the, of the presentations were irrelevant or not interesting. Um, after all, somebody has read and approved their proposal, but it's, it's because presenters don't do justice to their good material for a simple reason. It's because they forget about their audience. So uh, originally, this presentation was called Public Speaking and Uncommon Sense, because it simply deals with how to present by considering things from the viewpoint of listeners. So much of what I'm going to talk about today will seem rather obvious from where you sit now, but um, we tend to forget, don't we, when it's time for us to write and do our own presentation. Um, and so I, I've adapted it and geared it towards situations like JALT and like today's conference in which the audience is likely to come from a different specialty or academic background um, from the speaker and they might not be so familiar with the topic. Uh, and to bring it back to JALT, for me, very often the best sessions are those unexpected gems, right? The ones when you walk away energized by a great speaker, um, having learned something new or maybe with a fresh perspective on something that, that you thought you knew already. So this morning, we are simply going to look at visual aids, presenting with data, and then some general points about writing and planning. OK, so let's move on to the first topic, which is how to use visual aids to more effectively engage your listeners. Very often, we use visual aids because we feel like we should, not because they serve any real purpose. Right? So some of us are laughing nervously, um, and we've all seen this. And Gar Reynolds, the, the guy who writes the Presentation Zen blog and the book called Presentation Zen, he calls this a slide you meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, you know, it's kind of just aesthetically sort of boring, and it, it begs the question, why do we need a speaker at all? Can I just have your, your handout and go to the coffee shop and do something interesting? Um, but actually, there are deeper reasons why these slide you meant are ineffective, and we can start with the cognitive load theory, which was developed by John Sweller, an Australian educational psychologist. It deals with how people learn, and, and we remember new information. Basically, there's only a limited, a limited number of elements that we can retain in our short-term memory. We can only juggle so much at one time. And CLT has so many implications for instructional design and for teaching. As you would expect, cognitive load theory holds that short-term memory capacity increases and we learn better when the visual mode and the auditory mode are used together. They call this the modality effect. That should really be no surprise to any of us teachers here, right? That's, that's what we do. That's why we make visual aids. That's why we use pictures. It seems like common sense. But for me, what seemed very counterintuitive as I studied about this is what Sweller calls the redundancy effect. And this occurs, and I'm going to quote here, when the same material is presented simultaneously in written and spoken form, resulting in a learning decrement mm -hmm. compared to the material presented in written form alone or auditory form alone. So if the information is intelligible and adequate in one mode, then presenting it in another exactly the same way at the same time, it produces this extra cognitive load and requires us to needlessly use more of these, uh, these memory resources. So the key is that the information should be presented simultaneously um, in, spoken, in spoken and in written or graphic form. It should be complementary, not identical. Yes. All right, so again, complementary, not identical. Yeah, of course we need visual aids, but it shouldn't be exactly the same thing that you're saying. Good job on that, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so yeah, essentially we can say visual aids, we should strive to have visual aids that are visual images, charts, graphs, tables, simple text of course, yeah, key terms, it's really, really important to do that. According to Bloomberg Business, um, at any given second, 350 PowerPoint presentations are, be given, are being given somewhere in the world. And uh, PowerPoint has been installed on over a billion computers since it was first released over 20 years ago. Of course, today there's more slideware um, programs available, but PowerPoint still dominates the market. So it's, it's not surprising that people used to you tend to use it the way that it's installed on their computer. And um, it's the available technology, and they use it the most accessible and the easiest way, which is you know, the default bullet point settings. And blaming PowerPoint for ineffective presentations is like blaming computers or blaming pencils. Right? PowerPoint is fantastic, and probably everybody today is going to be using it uh, in some way. Um, it's great when you use it well. Although, um, I, I have a handout, and I've uh, put this down here. There's a great comedy routine on YouTube called Life After Death by PowerPoint, <laughs> given by a stand-up comedian who's also a, a tech engineer, so that's, uh, it's well worth checking out. Not all information lends itself to the bullet point, topic, subtopic yes. style of presentation. So one alternative is what's called assertion evidence slide structure, and it was, it was originally developed for science and engineering. The headline to the slide is a main assertion, a declaration, some kind of a concise sentence. And the body of the slide is the evidence that explains or supports the assertion. It could be a picture, it could be a table or a graph, um, even words arranged in a nice visual way. So, in a presentation like this, I would talk about re-photography and use these, explain these two examples, taken exactly in the same place in front of Shinbashi Station, 65 years apart. Now going back to the cognitive load theory, this utilizes the auditory mode as well as the visual mode in a more complementary way than just uh, text or just a list of bullet points. So if I may quote Professor Sweller one more time, in a list of bullet points, for novices in the content area, the additional work needed to knit together a coherent understanding of these connections between concepts and subconcepts would increase extraneous cognitive load. And remember today, I'm talking about bringing in novices to your content area. That's exactly what we're talking about. Um, so as another example of this, um, I'll to explain something that I'm going to present at the JALT conference this fall. After they take me off the waiting list. Um, here, at, here at LCJ, I teach public speaking class. And I videotape all of my students' speeches. And then they watch the videotapes and they grade themselves. They have the same grading rubric that I have. And then I compare their grades to my grades. And um, see, guys like me are part of the problem because I'm very text oriented. This is how I write, this is how I learn, this is how I organize things. And my first instinct uh, in November would be to make a slide like this as part of my presentation, which I could read with you, right? And, uh, or I could give you a minute and I could stop talking and then you could pretend to read it, to be polite to me, um, but probably more effective would be an assertion evidence style slide, right? In which I have sort of the main declaration of my findings and then I could explain what happened from speech to speech as the semester progressed, and then what it means, so what. So the assertion evidence structure is particularly useful for presentations that include results and analysis of research. Statistics. Yes, statistics. The findings, the analysis of your research have to be accurate, they have to be thorough, they have to be meaningful. We're, today we're spending our entire Saturday pondering the meaning of higher education, so research and statistical analysis are the basis of good scholarship in many cases. 
But we should talk about that analysis sparingly and judiciously, especially for listeners who are not in your field. Right? So for, and as an extreme example, my brother's a biologist. And uh, he regularly attends the Plant and Animal Genome Conference. And last year he told me he went to sessions called Genomics of Gene Banks and Mutation Screening. I, I don't know what those are. Um, but and audience members like my brother are likely to be specialists in those fields. Um, and also they might actually depend on the information in those presentations, mm -hmm. including the statistical findings to inform their own work. But on the other hand, at a conference like ours today or at JALP, we're probably far less likely to want to go deep into the numbers, right? Um, moreover, let's face it, people at the Plant and Animal gene con Genome Conference are probably even more likely to even understand all of the statistical analysis. So if you've done the quantitative research, most likely you're planning to write an article, or you already have. So if anybody's really interested in your t-tests, or your rash analysis, or your standard deviations, we can read your article, or of course we can send you an email. But sometimes that's the whole point, right? Your, your research findings, that's the whole purpose of your presentation. Um, so let's go over some good tips very briefly for presenting numbers when you do. So again, charts and tables are always preferable to, to just text. And if you make a table, have mercy on us and make the numbers easy to read and easy to follow. Let's face it, otherwise probably your audience isn't going to. Um, real quick, some things like rounding numbers off, putting spaces in at the thousands, right? No, nobody wants to really read that. You're probably more likely to take the second and a half that it takes to read numbers organized like that. Aligning the decimal points and using the same number of decimal places in each figure. It's kind of hard to read, your eyes are moving around, you might, you might not even want to bother. This is a lot more effective. And finally, line them up by the right, right just to find numbers. But most importantly, try to keep the focus on the main idea of the research and the results of what you found. That's probably the most relevant thing for your audience. Are there practical implications? Uh, implications for classroom practice? Is there opportunity for further study? Are there connections to other fields that we can make? Um, so make the numbers relevant for your audience. Finally, let's move on to planning and writing. So you've worked hard on your presentation, right? And um, you've worked hard to gather this data and this information. It's important. It's really important. And that's why presenters sink so deep into their own numbers and their own analysis and they really want to explain everything to their audience because they've invested themselves so much time and so much energy in it. But, um, sorry, a simple guideline to keep in mind as you're planning and you're writing. Your presentation is important. Yes, I don't mean to imply that it doesn't matter, so why bother? But it pays to be realistic. A. It's not a class, right? We're not talking about teaching a class when students, even the least interested and least engaged and least motivated students, will still be held accountable for this material um, via testing or another assessment, and thus they, they have to pay close attention. And B, your listeners are not depending on your presentation to inform their own research or writing or coursework. They don't have that instrumental motivation to, uh, to hang on to your every word. So of course it's important, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how to, how to show them it's important and share that good stuff with, uh, with your audience. In public speaking class, I, I always refer back to writing class as a reference point because all of my students have taken academic writing classes. They're familiar with the conventions of structure, essay structure and organization. And organization is key. Material that's already unfamiliar and maybe confusing or technical or sorry, not so interesting to everybody will be even more so if it's not presented in a coherent way. A solid structure is vital. Um, Steve Martin, when he wrote his auto, in his autobiography, he was writing about the time when he was the most famous comedian in the world. And he, he had one simple philosophy. He said, I always gave my performances, even my five minute talk show appearances, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I think that stand-up comedians have much to tell us about holding the attention of an audience that doesn't necessarily have to pay attention to them. 
But simply organizing your information in a speech isn't enough, right? It's not an essay and it's not an academic article. I always tell my students that we can't see your paragraphs when you're giving a speech. You have to tell us your organization. And uh, here are some easy ways to do so. Right, first of all, real simple, we call it an internal preview. It could come at the beginning of your presentation, uh, giving an overview of everything, or it could uh, come at the end of a, uh, the beginning of a long section, letting, letting the listeners know what to expect. Transitions are what we writing teachers encourage students to use in topic sentences. And like I said, in a speech it's even more important to tell your listeners, okay, we're done with this section, come with me while we move on to the next one. Signposts are just fancy ways to say list words. If you told us already that today I'm going to give you four examples of something, well, tell us when each one comes up and it's easier for us to follow you. Why not add a quick summary? at the end of a section or at the end of a speech. These are nothing fancy, and they don't really add any time or any effort to your presentation, uh, but they make such a difference. All right, um, sorry, really quick. One thing that I, I wanted to share with you since we're talking about I can't see your paragraphs. At the beginning of a presentation, this is not what I like to hear when I sat down to learn something new. And I know in many venues that this is acceptable standard practice, but it seems like a pretty surefire way to, uh, to make your audience start planning lunch or thinking about what's coming next. Um, finally, try to anticipate how much your audience is likely going to know about the topic. Of course, this is impossible to know exactly. Um, but scour your script for jargon, technical language, or topic or specific discipline, uh, discipline specific references, right? And um, I'm not suggesting to dumb down your information, but you should be prepared to briefly explain or summarize or translate as necessary. Remember, we're talking about a situation in which the audience really has nothing at stake other than the, the serendipity of unexpectedly learning something or being inspired or being challenged by you. They're unlikely to ask what something means unless it's completely glaring or they really just want to bust your chops and make life difficult for you. And I should add, what's the theme of today's conference? Crossing boundaries of culture and, and nations, not just boundaries of uh, academic disciplines. So this is especially important when you're presenting to people uh, who might not share the first, same first language as you. Today, we're all presenting in English, but not everybody's English comprehension level is the same. There's more to discuss. Eye contact, vocal variety, speaking notes, general energy level. Um, they are all vital to connecting with your audience, but perhaps the best thing to do is ask yourself a simple question. What's the goal of my presentation? Am I teaching the audience something? Am I challenging them? Am I trying to convince them? Maybe I'm entertaining them, that's okay. What are the most effective ways to achieve that? What's the most effective way to connect with the audience while I work towards that goal? Also, if I were going to attend this presentation, what would I like to get out of it? You've worked very hard on your presentation, so give yourself a chance to share it with your audience as effectively as possible. One last tip. Try to finish on time, right? Out of respect for the audience, out of respect for the other presenters, and out of respect for the event. I hope I didn't just break my last guideline. Thank you for listening. Whoa. Thank you, Roger. Um, actually, you're exactly right on the second. I can't believe it. Literally, 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Roger Grabowski, Jr.